I've been thinking a lot about a prison recently. It's at the very edge of Louisiana, in a meander of the Mississippi River, a big sweeping bend that curves for about 12 kilometres. The bank of the rivers are bayou or swampland, and the region's known for crocodiles, crawfish, and a slow pace. The prison's an outpost in this precarious land. When hurricanes come in, the levees can give way, and before you know it, the whole area's underwater, flooded with disease and fear. To get there, you drive down Louisiana's Route 66. This isn't the famous artery, but a single-track road with big cracks in it, and it stops suddenly. What looks like a crossroads is, for most people, just a dead end. You need official authorization to go any further. A sign warns, if you enter the white gates ahead, you could be inspected by trained dogs or have your body cavities searched. If it all sounds too much, you can take a quick right and visit the prison's museum instead. There, you'll see its notorious travelling electric chair and hear terrifying stories, like the time a group of inmates slashed their Achilles tendons to protest against forced labour. But if you've got the stomach for it, the next step's through security. Okay, it's big. You have to go through all these different checkpoint Charlies, as I call them. I was in the Air Force for a while, too. So to me, they were checkpoint Charlies, one after another after another, till you got to the center of the prison. Tom Mull is an American lawyer. He's been to this prison many times. It was a real scary place. It's one of the largest prisons in the United States. Home to some 8,000 prisoners and staff. It's called the farm because it is a farm. It's tens of thousands of acres. Prisoners work in the fields. The guards are there on horseback with shotguns across their arms, supervising the work. It's something else. The farm started out as a plantation where slaves were forced to work the land. That's a pretty gentle nickname for this prison, but it has others. This is the Alcatraz of the South or America's bloodiest prison. It's a tough lifestyle to accustom to, especially if you're in for a long time, drives a lot of people crazy. But eventually you learn to uh, survive, do what you have to, it's a rough place. It's maximum security and many of the inmates are here for life. They'll die inside the prison walls. They've been known to build their own coffins, and they have a commemoration field that's filled with rows and rows of white crosses. Death is in their veins, and death is at the heart of this story. I keep coming back to this prison because it holds a secret. Something that started in these damp corridors ended up contaminating lives around the world. It's a story of poison, greed and lies. And it's one of the biggest medical disasters in history. In tracing it back to its source, I've come up against bolted doors and stumbled down dead ends. People with answers have hung up on me and key witnesses have passed away. But Tom Mull knows that if you make it through one checkpoint Charlie, then another and another, then eventually you'll get to the room where it all began. I'm glad you're involved in telling the story. Nobody's really told the story. Nobody knows. Why do you think that is? Uh, part of it is it's unbelievable. You know, uh, Nobody can believe that... that at the point in time that they knew, and so many deaths could have been prevented, they failed to do anything but make the matter worse. That's hard to believe. And that's my goal, to get to the bottom of a mystery that's haunted people for decades, to find out could lives have been saved and who's to blame for thousands of deaths. I, I have to tell you, I'm pretty upset today. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll keep you guys going. I hope you, 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 you're able to do a tremendous story on this. But, and I'll feed you information, but whew, i got to move on. I'm Cara McGugan, and this is Bed of Lies, Episode 1, Infection.
I started looking into this story long before I ever spoke to Tom Mull. Back in May 2019, I had one of my busiest months as a journalist. I went to the home of a family torn apart by the Sri Lanka Easter bombings, and I interviewed two women who had fled North Korea. I flew to Northern Ireland for one feature, but my plane was so delayed I only had 20 minutes there before I had to turn back. Amid all this, there was one thing that I kept thinking about. At the beginning of that May, I saw a diary note for the opening of a public inquiry. The story was new to me, a terrible disaster that had led to people all over the world being infected with the deadly disease. But I'd barely heard of it, which seemed surprising. One reason is that it all happened long before I was born, in the 70s and 80s. It took years to come to light, and even then, parts remained in the shadows. But decades later, the tragedy that had started in that Louisiana prison had travelled all the way to a nondescript central London office block where the public inquiry was being held. And some of the survivors finally felt like justice was in reach. And I was there. One of the first people I spoke to that week was Claire. She took the stand and told her heartbreaking story before getting in a car and going straight to the hospital. I went with her and waited as she got test results. It was a pretty intense day. This has been something that should never have happened. It's the aftermath. When I decided to look into this scandal for Bed of Lies, I thought I'd start by going to see Claire in the West Midlands, where she lives, to see how she's been doing. Should we take our shoes off? No. Are you sure? Yeah. If you met Claire today, you'd have no clue about her traumatic past. She's tanned and healthy, and when I go to see her, she's wearing a long flowery dress. She has a new house in a village that runs along a river. She makes herself a jug of water with lemon wedges and gets me a tea with sugar. We sit down to talk and Claire gets into the lotus position. You know, the yoga position where you cross your legs on top of one another like a flower. She holds it for hours. It's pretty impressive, but she's looking after herself. I started yoga. So it, it became a bit of a joke because I like Guinness and standing on my head, but not at the same time. So, <laughs> so maybe we should start right at the beginning when you first met Brian. I met Brian in Leamington Spa. I was at school at the time. She says he was a bit of a Jack the Lad. Full of beans, raucous. You know, it was just fun. It was fun. Complete opposite for me. I was incredibly, incredibly shy. I, I hardly ever spoke. Um, it became quite a joke, actually, that, you know, Claire, <laughs> speak up. How quickly were you then in a relationship with Brian? Very quickly. I think it was, this was November time. I know we were started, our first night out was November the 21st, 1978. I just remember it because we went to, completely out of character again, we went to the local nightclub, Chimes, it was called, in Leamington. When we were at this nightclub, which was so unusual, Bod Stewart came on and it was, if you think I'm sexy, <laughs> that was out at the time. In those days, dressed in leathers. <laughs> was Brian dressed in leathers too? Leathers and jeans, that's how we dressed. Was he sexy? <laughs> no. <laughs> As the 80s dawned, Claire and Brian's relationship bloomed. They'd drive around the local hills in Brian's classic Ford and they'd stop at the pub for a lager top or shandy. It seemed so innocent, but there wasn't much to do. Claire delayed her plans to go to art school so she could be with Brian. He asked me to marry him just before my 21st birthday. They got married and moved to Devon. It was the beginning of our life together. We had so many hopes and so many dreams. What were some of your hopes and dreams? To eventually have children. We would have had children, but being only 21, one thing we did realise is that I had some time to go. I'm going to pause there because I want to introduce someone new, Frankie. That's not her real name, but she's a friend of Claire's. They didn't know each other back then, but their stories are pretty similar, so I'm going to tell them together. Claire puts me in touch. 
Hi, Carla. Hi, Frankie. How are you doing? She says she spent a long time feeling ashamed about her story. But after nearly 40 years, she's finally coming to terms with what's happened. Well, thank you for agreeing to have a quick chat with me. OK. Have you spoken much before? No. Um, I've never spoken in public. I mean, I've felt for many years that I, I was a murderer. I want to say Frankie isn't a murderer. That's not where this story's going. In fact, she's anything but. She's a strong woman who survived some horrific experiences. We agree to meet a few weeks later. We were doing the interview here at the inquiry because you didn't want to kind of bring this home. And that is that something that you feel quite strongly about? Definitely. I don't want to look at anything in my life now that can bring me any memory back of this situation and this story. So As Frankie talks, her rings chink against each other. These are all my mum's rings. I'm holding on to my mum as I'm talking to you. Do you want to talk about when you met Jo? Yeah, so I met Jo when I was 15. I was a little, little modder, um, very heavily into scooters, Lambettas, the mod world, and we met within that. Pretty soon, they had a scooter with a sidecar. We had a little dog who had goggles on and we were driving around, so, you know, it was fun. Frankie and Joe embodied the ambitious spirit of the 80s. It fitted in really well with Margaret Thatcher saying you can be anything that you want to be. Now the great Tory reform... Thatcher told people they could buy their own council house or start a business. Success was all about your mindset. We Conservatives believe in popular capitalism, believe in a property-owning democracy, and it works. We got engaged at 16. We bought our first house at 16. She pulls out her phone to show me a picture from that time. It's black and white, and there's a young girl with cropped hair. She's doe-eyed, and it's Frankie, but she barely looks old enough to have started secondary school. It's mental <laughs> how young we look. But they wouldn't let anyone hold them back. Our parents didn't want us to get married. They said, why don't you live together? But we were very old-fashioned. We want to get married, we want to do it properly. That's the sort of life we planned. That's Joe. I speak to him at the public inquiry too. And when did things start to change? Well, Joe got quite poorly. I came down with a, an illness um, where I basically passed out at work. His dad and Frankie took him to the big hospital in Birmingham. We didn't know what it was. They put him on a stretcher and they took him in. Joe's dad was still parking the car when a doctor gave Joe a surprise diagnosis, something that would change their lives forever. A doctor on call comes out to, to see me, only a junior doctor, and basically spurts out. It looks like AIDS is kicking in. And how do you react when you hear those words? I often think back to hearing those words and I don't think they even meant anything at all because we didn't really know what it was. We weren't really concerned about watching the news. We didn't even have a telephone in the house. Mobile phones weren't invented. I think if we'd even heard of AIDS, it was at, at risk prostitutes, drug takers, homosexuals. It wasn't part of our lives. We knew nothing, really. Even though I wasn't alive in the 80s, I can kind of understand what it's like to live in fear of a virus after 2020. We know what it's like to have that constant feeling that it could come for you, to be scared to hug someone or shake their hand, to think that if you drink from the same glass, you could catch it. When it came to AIDS, the fear was even more acute because it took much longer for information to come out. And when it did, it was terrifying. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. Anyone can get it, man or woman. So far, it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. It emerged in America 
and for a long time, people only got details by going to the States in person. But they knew one thing. This disease was deadly. And in the very early stages, we didn't even know whether it could be airborne. Carol was a nurse during the AIDS crisis. It became clear quite soon after that it was bloodborne. And it seemed to affect gay men and drug addicts. In the early 80s, infections grew across Britain and Carol's Hospital took on some of the first patients. It was terrifying, to be honest. And in the first weeks, I do remember the domestic staff walking out because they were so afraid. So I basically got down on my knees and showed them how to clean a blood spillage safely. The epidemic grew in the dark until 1984, when the first HIV test became available. More than 3,000 British people tested positive. It's actually quite hard going back to those times because we did see a lot of death you know, amongst young people, you know, amongst young drug users. And in those days, because there was no medication as there is now, people deteriorated quite quickly. The people on those wards were seeing the true toll of AIDS. But Joe and Frankie had no idea. When people go through something traumatic, they tend to keep it hidden away. Claire doesn't go to this place very often. In fact, she keeps a lot of her memories of Brian stored out of sight. They're in a box in the front room of her house, which doubles as a library. She gets it out to show me. What does it feel like looking at this stuff It's now? strange because I don't, you know, it's just there. I don't, I don't get it out, <laughs> so just for this reason. Yeah. She's got Brian's diaries, letters and home recordings that he made for himself. I think the actual tape's in here. If it's not, then I don't know where it is. I'll have to find it. Do you think this book contains notes from when he was diagnosed? Yeah. I had a blood test on the 4th of March to see if I have or am carrying the disease AIDS. I won't know the result for six or eight weeks. So he's writing this in his diary. And he says there, I hope it's negative. So, yeah, for Claire's to... sake, if nothing else. The results of Brian's blood test came back a few weeks after he wrote that diary entry. And Claire went to the hospital with him. And he was told at that appointment that he had tested positive for HDLV3, which meant that he had the virus. HIV, that is. And that he would go on to develop AIDS. But he was told that he was probably likely to have two or three years left to live and then he would die. Claire is softly spoken at the best of times, but sitting with her as she recalls the events of that day, I notice she shrinks from the memory. It was a shock. It was a shock for me. It was a shock for Brian. The nurse that was there handed me a box of rubber gloves and the doctor turned his back and went off. And that was it. There was no (laughs) counselling. There was no discussion. There was no empathy it was, here's a diagnosis, here's the prognosis. <laughs> Bye. Brian didn't know this, but up and down the country, other young men were getting similar news, like Joe. But how did they both get HIV? It turned out the disease was in their homes all along. It was just stored in a, in a kitchen cupboard. It was kind of like a pot and pan. And it was disguised as an innocuous medicine. It looked like you had boxes and boxes of, of paracetamol. That was it. More on that after this short break. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Theo Leloudis, the executive producer of Bed of Lies. We've spent months digging into this story, following the inner workings of the inquiry, sifting through long court documents to get to the truth, and piecing together difficult testimonies of what really happened. But making a podcast like this takes time, and we couldn't do it at all without the Telegraph subscribers. If you'd like to support journalism like this, and to read as much as you'd like on news, politics, sport, business, and more, head to telegraph.co.uk slash lies podcast where you can get 30 days free access to the telegraph online that's telegraph.co.uk slash lies podcast or click on the link in the episode description there's one thing i haven't told you about brian and joe they were both born with haemophilia a genetic condition passed down from mothers to sons that stops your blood from clotting okay i want to bring in simon and nigel they're identical twins from northern ireland and they're a similar age to Claire, Frankie and Joe. Like most twins, they talk with collective pronouns and finish one another's sentences. They're telling me about the reality of living with haemophilia. Which means that we are vulnerable to external bleeds um, from knocks and so forth and cuts. Those could bleed quite badly. But internally, that's where the dangers lie, in joints, bleeding into joints. That's Simon. These days, you can tell them apart when looking at them. Simon's got a white beard and Nigel's clean-shaven, but they sound pretty similar, so don't worry too much if you can't tell the difference. Our childhood was spent... uh, We tried to be as normal as possible, but our parents were very guarded and careful. And um, Nigel had sort of described a little bit of accident-prone in and out of hospitals. (laughs) Yeah. On one occasion, Simon actually bit his tongue and this... Very, very large. Uh, it was a clot, hem- a big hematos- clot, a kind of clot occurred, and and it, it it was enormous. I couldn't close my mouth, and it filled with blood, um, and it was attached to the bite section of the tongue where the damage was. And I was in hospital for well over two weeks. They tend to laugh away the scrapes now, but the threat of a bleed was always there. They had to avoid contact sports like rugby and instead they became talented rowers, something Simon still does today. But everyday tasks were more difficult. Take the dentist, for example, which can be terrifying at the best of times. When it came to the occasional extraction of a tooth, we, we also had quite a lot of severe bleeding then. And while that metallic blood was swilling around their mouths, there was always something in the back of their minds. My grandfather and his brother in the 60s both bled to death from wisdom teeth extractions. By the time Simon and Nigel went to secondary school, a new treatment had come around. It was called Factor 8, and for many people, it was life-changing. It looked like a synthetic powder, but it was actually made from human plasma. It's a bit stomach-churning, but stick with me. People with haemophilia lack a protein in their blood called factor VIII. In the 60s, scientists discovered a way to divide plasma, the yellowish part of blood, from the red blood cells. And they found that if you spin the plasma at a high speed, you can separate it into its different parts. And one of the things you get is factor VIII. They then made a concentrated form which became a revolutionary treatment for haemophiliacs. And they called that factor VIII too. Gone were the days of long hospital stays. Patients could treat themselves at home, add water to the powder and inject it yourself. And that's what's in those small bottles in Frankie's kitchen. So these treatments were seen as a wonder drug uh, to benefit all of us. But there was something deadly in Factor VIII and it started to infect the very people it was meant to help. And then the damage began. It was only when people started to get tested for HIV that the true scale was revealed. And before long, hundreds of people with haemophilia had been diagnosed, and some had started to die. In the halls of government and across the medical establishment, panic was setting in. What was known about this dangerous blood and how many people had been infected? It was all shrouded in secrecy. But that's a world away from Frankie and her husband, Joe. Basically, 
we carried on as normal, as if nothing was happening. That's Frankie. She and Joe want to get on with life, but when he's diagnosed with HIV, it throws a huge spanner in the works because they had something else to think about. Um, And at the time, I was pregnant. What should have been one of the happiest times of their lives was all of a sudden another obstacle. Back then, so little was known about the virus. Would the baby be infected? Time ticked on, and they needed to work out what to do. That would be the hardest decision of their lives. And the outside world made it a whole lot more difficult. It was a terrible time. The papers were uh, uh, haemophiliacs, Haitians, homosexuals. You fell into that category. If having HIV wasn't bad enough, the press made it so much worse. They went into overdrive. Tabloids called it the gay plague and ran stories with headlines like, I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, says Vicar. And at that time, there were journalists climbing up ladders to sort of try and look through windows to get pictures of AIDS patients. That's Carol, the nurse. So windows often had to be blackened out. Then one story came along that had everything. Celebrity, Hollywood glamour and a mystery illness. The papers became obsessed with Rock Hudson. People of my age grew up with Rock Hudson being a real sort of, a real man's man. And he was the first major celebrity to die from AIDS. Rock Hudson died tonight. He was 59. Tonight, tributes are pouring into the star's home in Beverly Hills. That made it worse because there was a whole raft of jokes. Unless you're affected by these things, you really don't understand the impact they have. And you sit there in pubs listening to AIDS jokes and people of my age discussing people dying of AIDS and how funny it was. Even T-shirts with jokes on the, uh, of AIDS at, the, at that time. After that, never again. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anybody about the haemophilia. I stopped carrying um, medication just in case um, it was seen. Pariah, a leper, someone who should be locked up, someone who should lose their job, somebody who you don't want to sit next to. You switch off from everything that's happening to you. It's almost like a schizophrenic lifestyle. If you are tested positive, you can't travel, you can't get travel insurance, you can't get mortgages. Certainly you didn't talk about it. You'd never talked about it to anyone. Just hide it away. So the married couples lived in secrecy. They changed jobs and moved towns. Despite everything, Claire and Brian wanted to look to the future. They went to the doctor. We said, well, you know, we'd actually quite like to have a baby. <laughs> you know, we would. We'd like, again, it's like, Let's reset, if you like, and we'll start again. Uh, let's, it, it was just hopes. It was like clinging on to hopes. The doctor said it wasn't a good idea, but still gave them the go-ahead. Nine months later, Claire fell ill. Really, really ill. She remembers riding her motorbike and having to pull over. I had f- flu-like symptoms like that I'd never had before, never, <laughs> never had since. At her next monthly checkup, the doctor said she wasn't pregnant and she needed to do an HIV test. Were you concerned? Yeah. So concerned that she decided to bury it, um, book a holiday. Brian and Claire had some friends in California, and they booked flights on a whim. Brian decided not to tell the authorities that he had HIV. He didn't want his passport to be stamped with AIDS. Luckily, they didn't check his bag, so they didn't see his Factor Eight bottles. When they were finally on the plane, in the air over the Atlantic, Claire panicked. I suddenly remembered that I'd not got the results of my test. And so I turned to Brian and said, no, I forgot to ask. That was the state I was in. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, it is positive, they told me. How long had he known for? I think he just found out. I think he... But I suppose he probably thought, well, I won't tell her, let's go. I was just looking out the window. It it was surreal. It had been a whirlwind, a couple of years of being married, being told your husband is 
going to die of AIDS and um, then finding out you're positive. It was like I was watching somebody else's life and I kept just finding ways of, of surviving. This isn't a happy story. In fact, it's about to get pretty bleak. But it's important we cover this before I get to the scandal, to the lies and the cover-up, because it's the tragedy of what happened that made me want to investigate. Brian started taking AZT, an aggressive cancer drug that was given to AIDS patients in the hope it would make them live longer. But it only made him worse. He had developed a, a lump on his neck and they diagnosed it as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Brian had cancer, or what was then described as full-blown AIDS, but he didn't want to let it dominate the last years of his life. Brian was becoming more agitated and wanting to live life to the full. He wanted to do things that were sort of like, would have cost lots of money, he wanted to just do things, and quite right too. He decided to buy a Land Rover and he kitted it out as a camper van. He put a bed in the back and loaded it with his things. Claire sewed some curtains and made a couple of cushions. He wanted to go on a big trip and drive to Iceland. He planned to take the ferry and stop off at the Orkney, Shetland and Faroe Islands. It was a five-week tour. Claire was busy working, so she planned to join him when he got there, and she gave him a small leather book so he could keep a diary, and he took a dictaphone with him as well. Now, those recordings were hidden in a box somewhere in Claire's house, stored away, gathering dust. She finds them after my visit, on an old cassette tape, Brian's voice preserved in a box while the outside world changed. She has a tape player in her car, and she gets the cassette working. She sends me a voice memo as she listens. I found his back road. Wow, I can't recognise the voice. Gosh, that's the first time I've heard his voice in in 28 years. It's just just so different from what I remember. Wow. I've just seen the first waterfall, but there's certainly a sense of feeling that uh, it's a it's a country in the making. I flew in for two weeks. He met me. I flew back. Do you remember any details, things you did from that holiday, like the kind of last exciting things you did together? You're bathing in the Blue Lagoon. Well, we're here at the Blue Lagoon now. Well, Claire is here now as well. We're just going to stop and have some breakfast. We've been to the Blue Lagoon and I've been and had a swim. We're just leaving the site now where we had some bacon and baked beans and bread and an egg. Brian broke the yolk. And we're just leaving now and I've just taken some photographs of some of the fl flora. And beautiful and in the distance it's beautiful and warm and sunny but in the distance there's a black cloud hanging over. They drove for miles and miles in the middle of nowhere on their own. Seeing very few people and enjoying the, the sights and somewhere he'd always wanted to go. We just had an Indian meal in the highest tandoori restaurant in the world. It's also the fucking most expensive one if you ask me. I'm not exactly feeling sad, but I should be sad to see Claire go because I should like then have another 10 days on my own. In the book he says, I'm really missing Claire. These extended holidays on your own are no good. You've got to be with somebody. You found to keep your spirits up when they start flagging. Makes you feel pretty lonely. On the final leg of the journey, with home in sight, Brian's spirits are lifted. Everybody's out making hay. 
So you know what that means, don't you? I think I should sit down when I get back to Tours Haven in the harbour and try and catch up on the old diary. Uh, while I've been thinking about driving back there, I must get on and start writing my autobiography. If I use this tape recorder then I won't forget. It had only been ten days since Claire last saw Brian, but she noticed something different about him. He was emaciated, he was ill. It was really the beginning of the end. Brian got more and more ill over the next two years. But I think what had happened to him mentally was the was the AIDS, that he'd been given this. He'd been given it. And by the beginning of 1993, he was in hospital most of the time. Was he treated any differently in the hospital? Oh, yes. He was treated badly in hospital. They didn't want to touch him, didn't want to come near him. March 13th, 1993, is a day Claire will remember for the rest of her life. The weather had been terrible for weeks and the rain was pouring down. It was morning and Brian asked her to help him get out of bed. There was a magpie outside the the window and he just said, it's a magpie, you know. It was like one for sorrow kind of thing. You know, just It was really poignant. Later that day, the doctor came up to her. and said, you do know he's going to die. And I said, yes, of course I do. And he said, no, like now, in the next few hours. And, um, and so that was the first time I cried. Claire called Brian's parents and his brother, who raced to the hospital. She sat there and held his hand. And as she waited with him, she thought about her own diagnosis of HIV. Would this be her fate too? Who's going to be there for me? You know, it's, that was frightening. To think to die alone in a hospital, to be subjected to the stuff that he was being subjected to. Brian's family arrived just in time. By that time, he was labouring his breath and it's almost like he was hanging on for them to come but he'd, got, he'd kind of lost consciousness by that time and then, and then he died at sort of 10 o'clock that Saturday evening When Brian was buried a week later the sun finally broke through the clouds and a bird appeared at his graveside All the things that happen to you are sent as a trial. And when your number is called up, if your number's called up, there's nothing you can do about it. The things that are sent to try you to somehow test your strengths, I guess, just goes to show how quickly life can be snatched away from you. You enjoy everything while you can, especially each other and loved ones. For all the heartbreak that followed for Claire, mourning her husband, having to tell people that he had died of cancer rather than AIDS, and fighting her own battle with HIV, there was a growing sense of anger. Because as time wore on, it became clear that Brian's death was no accident. And so, with Claire's blessing, I want to help her find out who killed Brian. Who was responsible for his poisoning? Who could have stopped it all? And what really happened in that Louisiana prison? Coming up on Bed of Lies. It's certainly hard to believe they sold all this product knowing it was infected so that other people would take it. Yeah, fuck. I read that letter and I thought, good grief, this looks like haemophiliacs have been experimented on. This material should not have continued to be imported into this country, and it was. Do you think that it seems like the pharma companies have got away with it? Totally. Bed of Lies is written by me, Cara McGugan, and produced by Sarah Peters at Tuning Fork Productions. The executive producer is Theodora Leloudis and sound designs by Peregrine Andrews, with thanks to Tom Gibbs and Giles Gear. 
To stay on top of who's who in our story and to read exclusive behind-the-scenes details, take a look inside my reporter's notebook. We'll be publishing more every week at telegraph.co.uk forward slash notebook. You can listen to the award-winning first series of Bed of Lies, which investigates a very different scandal on this podcast feed. And if you're not already a Telegraph subscriber, sign up for 30 days free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash lies podcast.